Greetings. My name is Guy Dornsey, and this is the show Change the World, where I like to invite guests from Southern Vancouver Island onto the show who have big, bold ideas for the future, or thinking in the same way that I am about the need to change the world in exciting, visionary ways. Today, I have Rob Douglas. Welcome to the show. Thanks Rob, for having me. crazily busy, I can imagine, as well as having a family and kids. And if I'm right, five generations on Vancouver Island, right? Living up at the top of Mount Suhailin, well, halfway up maybe, right? Anyway, Rob is a, a councillor for the Munis municipality of North Couchen, previous director with the Couchen Valley Regional District. You've been a columnist with the Couchen News Leader. You served on the board of the Couchen Land Trust, Volunteer Couchen, the Couchen Cooperative Connections, the Couchen Elder Care Cooperative. It goes on, a busy, busy man. And we're gonna talk about our economy, right? And how do we build our new economy? So jump in, what are your, what's your take off the top? Why do we need to build a new economy? Yeah, I think a lot of us are, are, are frustrated with the current state of the economy. Um, you know, you look at especially a lot of people in my generation, there's, that, there, there's a real lack of good paying jobs out there. Yeah. And I think a lot of us as well, we want to develop a more uh, sustainable economic model where we're, we're, we're managing our resources in a way that we're, we're leaving enough for, for future generations. And uh, you know, for, for me, one of the most attractive models out there is uh, the, the cooperative economics. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've had cooperatives in our economy for, for, for years, it's an underappreciated uh, part of our, not only our local yeah. economy, but across BC and Canada. Um, yeah, and it was part, part of my attraction of that model. I, I started promoting that a number of years ago. Yeah. And uh, you know, about, about two years ago, uh, I teamed up with a colleague of mine, uh, Roger Hart. He uh, was a member of our Economic Development Commission in the Cowichan region, a yeah. well-known community activist. And uh, we'd grown frustrated with a lot of the traditional approaches to, to economic development. So what we developed was uh, what we called our five big ideas. Right. And a lot of that focused on cooperative economics. One of them specifically was to promote cooperatives as a model of economic development. Well, let's see if we can get to all five. All um, five, yeah, that'd be great. Just, just stay focused on crops. A while ago on this show, we interviewed the people from Viridian, the solar cooperative, yeah, yeah. and that was really good. They are, you know, I think 12 of them fully own the show. Once a year, they get together and share out the profits and reinvest what they need. And I got the sense that of a, it's got like an authenticity of worker engagement because there's no boss separate from them. They are their own boss. They decide their own work. They, sh they earn their own money. They, it's like, it had a feeling that that's the way things should be. We sort of take for granted that it's good to own your own home, and, but we take for granted that someone else owns your place of work. How many cooperatives are there in the Couchin region, do you know? In the Couchin region, um, yeah, I don't have the precise number, but you know, you've got Viridian, like you yes. mentioned. Or on um, the island as a whole, do you know? Also, you know, do you know it's even yeah, big. there's about you know, seven, 750 in, in BC. I yeah. think there, yeah, there's a f few dozen here on the island. Right. Um, you know, we've got a number of them based on the mainland, though, that operate on, yeah. on the island as well. But in the Couchin Valley, yeah, there's Viridian. Um, you know, there's an artist co op, imagine that. Right. There's some other smaller artist co ops as well. Uh, we had Island Savings Credit Union based yes. in Duncan, which is now part of part yeah. of First West. Yeah. Uh, we've got a new agricultural co-op. Uh, right. You know, the cow co-op. Yeah, the cow co-op. Co yeah, cow op, right? Yeah, yeah, online marketplace yes. for farmers, yeah. and then there, you know, there's a new elder care co-op that's in its early stages, yeah. and a few other smaller ones as well. The elder care co-op. That's that's interesting because um, a lot of us assume when we get old and grey. I've got no old and grey on me at all, right? One day we're going to be wheeled into a home when we can't look after ourselves and just pay out to someone else all the time. So how does the elder care co-op work? Is it the workers or the people in the home who are part of the co-op? Yeah, the, the idea was for the, the people in their homes uh, to, to be the members of the co-op. Okay. And the idea was that they would uh, coordinate uh, home care services yeah. so they could age independently in their own homes. You say the idea was, it didn't happen or it's... Yeah, my understanding is they're going through a bit of transitioning right now. One of the, the early model they developed yeah. didn't work out as planned, partly because one of the existing providers was able to maintain their funding. So in that sense, it was yeah. a, a good news story, but they've had to, to shift their focus since then. But I, I know in the Italian region of, um, say, Bologna, which is in, up in the Emilia-Romagna region, there's a whole lot of, of social care cooperatives when the people doing the nursing, the social care, the social work are themselves organized in cooperatives, and that's recognized by the state and seen to be a more efficient way of delivering care. More efficient sounds very capitalist, but also more caring because the, there's no sense of workers being exploited. 
Yeah, yeah, my, my understanding of that is the workers are still paid at a high rate, there's still a high yes. unionization rate and yeah. high levels of job satisfaction. But yeah, my, my understanding of that is when there was a, we saw the movement towards privatization of a lot of our social yeah. services in that region, they decided to go a different route instead, um, you know, not to privatize yeah. it, but to focus I, more on cooperatives and local control. I've only worked in the care profession for a short while when I was a, you know, younger, when I was an orderly in a hospital. But I, to be in the caring profession when in your daytime you're giving care out, but you're being treated abusively by your employer, mm -hmm. is such a contradiction in terms, isn't it? You're all, you know, they fire all the unionized workers and bring in non-unionized workers to pay them, you know, less pay. So cooperative social care, is that talked about in British Columbia as a way for the future? Uh, not, not, not as much yeah. as probably it should. I'm open now with the change in provincial government yeah. that it becomes a bigger part of the conversation. So let me throw this right off the top. If you were asked to be the new minister for cooperatives, say you've been elected as MLA <laughs> and you were the minister for cooperatives, what would you do to encourage more co-ops in BC? Well, I think first off, naming a minister responsible, whether it's a full-blown minister of cooperatives yeah. or just adding that as part of their yes. portfolio. So yeah. even if you go back to the late 90s, the previous NDP government did have a minister for cooperatives. Right. For a time, it was Jen Pollinger, our yes, local MLA in the Couch yeah. Valley. And they, um, they, they set up a modest program to support cooperative development. But if yeah. you look at the statistics, there, there's evidence that it, it was quite successful in helping yeah. a, a lot of new co-op startups. Right. So I think, I think that would be a big part of it. Um, I think you also need legislative changes as yeah. well. So if you look at a lot of other jurisdictions, they've set up uh, community investment funds. Some of them set up as cooperatives or other yes. similar models. But they're able, yeah. they're able to redirect a lot of investment into um, yeah. cooperatives and other uh, and social enterprises. Yeah. But the problem here in BC, we don't have the legislative framework to really facilitate that. And yeah. uh, you know, we would need changes at the provincial level to, to make that so happen. The, the community investment fund is your big idea number two. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So all the, the ideas are all connected. Well, that's that's yeah. okay, we can, we can weave back and forward. So yeah. I heard someone say the other day that all of the money we put into RSPs for his retirement, 100% of it is invested off island somewhere else. And he was suggesting if we had some sort of communi community investment vehicle, it was Rupert Downing was talking about this. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, could we channel some of our savings into viable investments here on the island and use our own money to support our own local development? Mm -hmm. Is this the kind of thing you've been working on for this? Yeah, so uh, the colleague of mine, Roger Hurt, I developed yes. these five big ideas yeah. uh, with. We calculated it's about $80 million a year that residents in the Couch and Valley are putting towards our RSPs. Wow. And yeah, as Rupert said, probably all or yeah. um, nearly all of that's leaving the community and going to the big financial centers in Toronto and Wall Street and in, in, in Hong Kong. Right. And so I, I think what R Rupert Downing and his group, the Vancouver yes. Island Community Investment Co-op, what they want is to redirect some of that to our, to our local economies. Yeah. And I mean, just imagine if even half of that, out of say 80 million a year, if we could redirect 40 million of that to, yeah. to investments in, so the, just, in the community. You just need a, a portfolio of businesses that's where enough of them are gonna succeed yeah. <laughs> to pay a regular you know, percentage for the retirement fund. And you can, you know, calculate maybe a few are going to fail, but overall you've got enough to balance it. Yeah, and, it, and it's not just some pie in the sky idea. There's other jurisdictions that have been doing this for years, and they've seen yeah. quite a bit of success. So the the one model in Canada that's been around the longest is in Nova Scotia. They got these okay. community economic development investment funds, yeah. and currently there's, uh, I believe, 40 of them with about an investment pool of about 50 million dollars. Wow. And are they RSP eligible? Yeah, that, that's my understanding. Yeah. yeah, and there's a 35 percent tax credit, which is the yeah. You know, the, the important incentive that we need here in British Columbia to, to, to make it viable. So they've got the tax credits and then they've got just the regulatory framework is uh, set up in such a way that it's easier for communities to do this. Um, whereas in BC, we've got much more complicated regulatory framework. Yeah, I mean, this is too boring for television, but I know that getting the legislation right mm -hmm. makes a huge difference. I mean, there's one example in Italy, they have passed this law called the Macora law. Whereas if you're getting unemployment benefit, you can actually pool the benefits to help you start a cooperative. And, that, then, and, and I think um, in Germany, they, they allow by legislation that if you're, instead of being full-time unemployed, you can keep your job part-time and the government will top your wages up instead of, because it's cheaper than someone being unemployed all the time. But it takes that piece of legislation to put it into place. And we're talking at a time when we just got this new government that hasn't yet come into power, but hopefully we can achieve some of these good things. Yeah, and there's other legislative changes they can make as well. So you mentioned Italy, and they've got this um, indivisible reserve legislation so that yeah. uh, 
a cooperative can uh, put their profits into an indivisible reserve, and they they won't be taxed. They'll be taxed either not taxed or at a lower rate, but they're. The requirement is they've got to reinvest it. Um, they're required to put some of those profits into that reserve, I think, right? Yeah, for the, lo for the lower yes. tax rate. But then, yeah. but then they have to reinvest it in the company or save well, it as well, a... It means they've got in the, the, the pool of capital when they need to invest in new tools and equipment, whatever, they've got that money. Yeah, there, or right? a rainy day fund if there's tough economic times yeah. and they don't want to lay anybody off. So, the, yeah. But that's the result of changes at the legislative level, which yeah. I think we need here. We would need here in British Columbia to... Uh, right. To so, give co-ops a better chance at growing and becoming an even even bigger part of the economy. I know you took your five ideas to the North Couchin, right? Oh, I took them to the Couchin Valley the regional, regional district. district. That's right. Yeah. And what was the response? No, it was a good response. Part of the um, so so at that time we've had a small economic development department at the regional district going yeah. back to 2001, and you know in early 2015 I had just been elected to the board right. and. Uh, you know, at that time, we'd, we'd lost some long-term staff, so it was really seen as an opportunity to kind of start over and look yeah. at some new approaches to economic development. Yes. And the, the traditional approach, as you know, it's generally focused on try to attract and retain outside investment, yeah. try to convince some corporation to yeah. come to your community and open a big box store, or maybe a factory or something yeah. like that. Which, I mean, is fine if some company wants to come and set up shop and provide employment and provide decent wages, I think that's great. But it's a, it's a passive approach. We're, we're just kind of sitting back waiting for it to happen and maybe yeah. creating the right conditions. And what I was getting at with the five big ideas is, is us taking a much more active approach and trying yes. to mobilize what resources we have in the community to create the economy we want. Yeah. So with cooperatives, you're not waiting for some company to come set up shop. You're teaming up with your friends and neighbors and colleagues and you're creating a business you're yourself. Right. Or the community investment fund, you're taking yeah. your retirement savings instead of handing them over to Wall Street to decide what to do with them. You're, you're deciding yourself how you want to invest yeah. these. So there's, two, there's several things happening here. A, starting your own business. B, starting your own cooperative. But see the merit of locally owned businesses as opposed to businesses with head office in Toronto or you know, Wall Street, somewhere like that. Yeah, and that was one of our other big yeah. ideas is, is putting an emphasis back on local ownership because it right. feels like that, that gets lost a lot these days. Are there benefits to local ownership as opposed to distant ownership? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of us in our gut, we just like the idea better. So even if you look at that Harmac pulp mill and yeah. I mean, the fact that the employees own 25% of it, I think yeah. a lot of people just, just like that idea. It makes sense to have people in the community making these uh, decisions about production and, and long-term yeah. investment, that sort of thing. But if, if you look at even some of the statistical and yeah. uh, academic research that's been done on it, there's quite a body of evidence to show that it's better for our local economies to have local ownership. Yeah. Because as I understand it, I mean, businesses as well as selling their muffins or their boots are spending money on, on printing, on local lawyers, on advertising. And, and if that's all done locally as well, that money is staying. Whereas a distant, op the distant company will have a lawyer in Chicago. And oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So UBC did a big study a couple of years ago and they found they compared uh, uh, office supply companies. They took one local office supply yeah. company and two um, chain office supply yes. companies. And they found that the, the local one spent twice as much of its revenue on w local suppliers right. as opposed to, to the chains. So it would be like Monks versus Staples in that sense. Yeah, they, they didn't, I, I, don't, I don't believe they named them in the no, study, no. but yeah, something along those like lines, yeah. 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 Not going to be in trouble from one or the other of those, right? <laughs> and there, there, there was another big study done a few years ago by uh, Civic Economics. It's a research group that looks at the impacts yeah. of local investing. And they said in BC, if we shifted 10% of our spending to local businesses, um, you know, we could create another 31,000 yeah. jobs and another, you know, 940 million in additional wages for, for right. British Columbia workers. And there's got to be another issue too, because if you're a local business, you know that your business is based on the loyalty of relationships. Mm -hmm. And you've got to keep those. You've got to be nice to people and you've got to be honorable and you've got to do, act in a trustworthy way. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're far, far away and you're looking after 25 groups, you know, you can look at the, oh, we'll save money, we'll cut that staff, and we'll save money, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. And it's all impersonal and objective instead of feeling and subjective. Mm -hmm. So it, you're bringing more of a human spirit into business, mm -hmm. which is, has to be good, right? Well, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, certainly, the, 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 to me, the essence of a good downtown is lots of small locally owned businesses with charm and quirk, and they're different, and you get to know people. Yeah. I mean, Duncan's good for that, Ladysmith is good for that. Shopping mall land, I don't find has the same charm quite often. Yeah. 
So we had starting cooperatives, community investment funds, local ownership. What was your, what are the other two ideas? Yeah, so, so one of them is, uh, we're calling anchor institutions. Okay. So you look at any given community, you've typically got, you know, your school district, your post-secondary institutions. Yes. You know, in Couch Valley, we've got a, a VIU campus yes. there. Municipalities, yeah. uh, hospitals, health authorities. Right. And uh, what, what a lot of commentators now refer to these as is anchor institutions. We call them anchor institutions because with a lot of your big companies, there's always the fear that if you know you raise taxes too much, you put in too many regulations, or you know yeah. workers want higher wages, they're going to leave and they'll you know shut down the factory and go right. set it up in China or some other. But you can't shut down a hospital; it's going to be there. Yeah, they're, they're stuck. Yeah, and and they've got a tremendous amount of economic power that yeah. people well, they're often purchasing all the time. They're purchasing supplies. Yeah, purchasing supplies or just hiring yeah. people locally. So even if you go you know down the highway to the Couch Valley, yes. the, you know VIU, the school district. I, Island Health, yes. these are some of our biggest employers in the region. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I think we often lose sight of the fact that how much power they have over the local economy and how they can you know, yeah. move us in a direct, different direction if, if, they, if they choose. And are there good examples you know of where these anchor institutions are using their purchasing power in a, in a way to build the local economy? Yeah, That's there's some interesting examples in the state. So you look at a lot of the, the major metropolitan centers in you know, Boston and yes. Detroit. And, San Francisco and these places where you've got cases of, you know, some of the bigger universities and, yeah. and, and hospitals and that sort of thing, um, you know, using their purchasing power or through hiring decisions or in some cases even they'll have significant real estate holdings and they'll use that to create affordable housing for, for right. people in the surrounding communities. Yeah. And often with their hiring decisions, they'll try to target, you know, more disadvantaged and vulnerable segments of the population, some of yeah. these inner city neighborhoods to give them more employment opportunities. I mean, I mean, indirectly, their purchasing power, we, if, to the extent that we own those facilities as citizens, their purchasing comes out of what we contribute to through taxes. So you'd want their purchasing to favor socially positive policies. Oh, oh definitely, yeah. yeah. You know, and the, the one really interesting example is in Cleveland, Cleveland right now. Yes. So they've got two of their major uh, medical facilities and their, one of their major universities have teamed yeah. up with some nonprofit organizations for this large initiative which is focused on you know through purchase, local purchasing yes. to support small businesses they're hiring a lot of people from inner yeah. city, city city neighborhoods and putting an emphasis on affordable housing right. and, and and there's been some evaluations done of that which have found it's yeah. succeeding so far but what's really neat about that one is they've um, helped set up what's called the evergreen cooperatives right. so it's modeled on some of the cooperative uh, economies in spain and they've got these three cooperative worker cooperatives right. where the employees own the business all uh, interlocked with one another one does industrial laundry yeah. another does uh, an industrial greenhouse growing organic yeah. produce and the third one installs solar panels right. much like Viridian energy yeah. our local co-op but they're getting their guaranteed purchasing contracts from the big anchor institutions, the Yeah, from the big anchor institutions. That's right, yeah. And then they've also now signed contracts with a lot of local, you know, hospitals yeah. and grocery stores and that sort of thing. But they're targeting a lot of, um, you know, lower income people from some of these inner city neighborhoods and giving them, right. you know, s stable, decent paying jobs. Then they get an ownership stake in these. I remember I was um, at a, a gathering around food policy in, in Victoria and the head of purchasing for food at UVic outlined what efforts he made to buy from local growers. And it was really impressive that, you know, the, the detail which he, he maximized purchasing from local as opposed to just buying it on the ship, whatever's mm -hmm. cheapest, right? Yeah, and I know I'm sure there's all kinds of in individual efforts going on, but what I was pushing for when yeah. I was on the CVRD board was to bring these different players together in some kind of yeah. coordinated initiative. Did they come together? Did it happen? Not yet, but, Not I'm, yet. but I'm hopeful, because uh, I'm looking at the, the long game here, so yes. I don't expect things to change overnight. Yeah. But, yeah. So, that, so the fifth initiative of the five big ideas was to do with cops working together, I think, something like that? Yeah, well, we, we call that small business support. So, okay. you know, we, we were talking earlier about Emilia Romagna in northern yes. Italy, so it's got one of yes, the most... So, so for viewers, Emilia Romagna, if you picture Italy, it's between Venice and Florence, right, there, where they make Parmesan cheese and wine and motor vehicles, Alfa Romeo and things as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's one of the most advanced. Right. And same popu similar population to British Columbia. Yeah, and it's about four and a half million yeah. people. But it's, um, you look at a lot of the literature on economic development, some of the alternative approaches, a lot of it focuses on Emilia Romagna. Yes. And part of it is cooperatives account for about 30% of their GDP. Whoa. And also because they're 
per capita in income is about 25% above the national average. Right. So it's a it's a high wage economy. Yes, it's successful. Yeah. Yeah, but but despite that, they've um, they've managed uh, to, to remain globally competitive and also uh, to keep many of their firms very small. So in, in a lot of ways, their success kind of defies all the yeah. rules of globalization. And that. so so you you were mentioning them in the context of business support. Yeah, that's right. So how does that work for them? Yeah, so you know they got four and a half million people. They got about ninety thousand manufacturing firms. Wow. So just to give you the scale, yes. you know, somewhere like New York's got you know four or five times as many people, but yes. less than a third of the manufacturing yeah. firms. So okay. there's a high degree of concentration of these yes. manufacturing firms, but over half of them stayed small. So over half of them got you know like less than fifty employees. Yeah. And there's only a handful of more than five hundred employees, and these are generally cooperatives owned right. by the workers. So they've managed to keep their um, small, medium-sized business, a lot of artisans, which as I said, kind of yeah. defies what are supposed to be the rules of globalization and how to build a, you know, right. a competitive economy in today's world. And they've done that for a number of reasons, like part of it's the, you know, the culture uh, in Emilia Romagna that's al allowed you know, these different firms to build a certain amount of trust amongst one another. Right. But the, the regional government has also put in place supports to facilitate this. What kind of supports? Yeah, so back in the 70s, they brought together these different players like trade unions and chambers of commerce and yeah. these various associations. Even that idea in British Columbia is like... Yeah, yeah, that's a <laughs> radical idea. But here. they're working together. They're Go working on. together yes. and they've created these, uh, they call them real service centers. And they, these have been studied in the economic yeah. development literature. Yeah. And what they do is they provide a lot of these business services that, you know, big corporations would have at their disposal, but the small firms typically wouldn't right. have. Right, yeah. So that might mean... Um, you know, research and analysis or expertise on sales and marketing or, yeah. you know, advanced research and testing or exporting co contracts and detailed stuff. Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. So the, the, they'll, they'll conduct all this detailed research, scan yeah. the globe on the latest consumer and market trends and technological advancements. And they feed this information back to these small firms. And that allows them to, um, you know, they don't have to deal with that, that yeah. side of the business. Now, um, is that done as a government service or do the small firms pay something to pay for that service? You know, my understanding is part of it's a government provided, and then it focuses on specific sectors of the economy. I thought that they're putting a, a sort of half percent of their turnover back into a funds to pay for that stuff. Well, there's another model. The, the, they've also set up a shared service model as well. Okay, so a lot two, of, two things going on there. Yeah, yeah so that, that's par okay. part of the supports available to them. Then the other side of it is uh, through their sectoral organizations. Oh, that's what they're putting the money into. Yeah, they set up these shared services models. So a lot of them will provide like the back backroom functions, like legal right. and payroll and HR and that sort of thing, and IT support, and they pay into that. So it's all these um, business services that. Uh, you know, many cases they wouldn't have access to, yeah. or in other cases would kind of distract them from the, the real work of, yeah. you know, run I mean, a successful if you're a, business. If you're a company with four or five people, you just, you can't bother with that stuff. Yeah, you're too, yeah. too busy. So, so it allows them to stay very specialized, and as a result of that, now that region of the world produces some of the, you know, yeah. highest quali quality artisan products. Um, so basically, they're cooperating together as private businesses and as crops. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, in a lot of them, they um, what often happens is they'll when they reach a certain size, they'll kind of split into two and yeah. just stay specialized in their particular areas. But even after they split into two, a lot of times these are you know individuals who work together for decades. Yeah. They maintain maintain those relationships and that trust. Because the ethos that I grew up with in Britain, and it's certainly true here in Canada, is if you're in business, you know you're you're making a profit for yourself. You're on your own, so stay on your own. And what I'm hearing here is something that they're saying, no, let's help each other and become more successful by helping each other. Yeah, and if you even, uh, you know, Robert Putnam, a number of years ago, wrote a book called Bowling Alone. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, he actually wrote a whole book about him in the Romania. He didn't focus much on the economics, but the political side of it. But he oh. talked about their high levels of social capital. Right. And so that's what makes a lot of these firms successful, is there's that degree of trust uh, between these co-ops and small businesses and artisans. Okay, so then when he wrote Bowling Alone, which is like, you know, the isolation of people in North America, so he's got this awareness of a high, highly engaged community when everyone's talking and helping and doing and stuff like that compared to the solitudeness of selfishness, really. Yeah, yeah oh, that's right. Yeah, and what, what we were advocating for with those small business supports is we thought we could apply that at a, perhaps a regional level across the yeah. island here or even just in the couch and valley. And part of what we advocated for was uh, a sector-specific focus. You yes. think of some of our natural advantages, say in the couch and region, Forestry is 90% of our land base. Yeah. You know, why not focus on value-added forestry and helping right. grow new businesses in that sector or 
yes. value-added agriculture or, or tourism right. or maybe you know artisan products. Yeah. So that could be either with, the, with government services to help those or with the service elements when they themselves would pull money to pay for a higher level support function yeah, to be more and, efficient. And then, you know, the, the, the Italian model, they brought together chambers of commerce, trade unions. Yeah. I'd love to see something like that here. You know, we've got yeah. community futures and various other, uh, you know, yeah. regional economic development bodies as well. So this, I mean, I can see a whole body of ideas you're putting together here that fits, you know, the cooperatives, the community investment funds, the anchor institutions, the local businesses, the businesses supporting each other, it sort of adds up to a, a new vision of how the, the economy can work. How have local entrepreneurs and business people responded to your thinking? You know, when we, uh, so when we first developed these five big ideas with, with my uh, good friend Roger Hart, we, we wanted to get as much publicity for them as well to really yes. create a discussion. So we published them in the Couch Valley Citizen. And right. we had a, yeah, just a tremendous response. A lot of it, you know, progressive activists you'd expect yeah. would be keen on these ideas, but a lot of it was, you know, business owners as well, you know, Good. some conservative yeah. business owners who yeah. were very excited about the idea. Well, alas, we can't buy more time, cooperatively or otherwise. We're, uh, half an hour's flown by, so I'm out of time here now. It's not even time for a last question, look. I, I love the, the fact that you're focused on this while in a role as a councillor and an activist in the community and, and young, so you've got 50 more years you can put into this to see it all happen. So look, thanks for all hey, thanks your for contribution to yeah. the whole community there. Um, my name has been, my name is, <laughs> my name is Guy Dornsey. This has been the show Change the World. One of my contributions is a book called Journey to the Future, set in Vancouver in the year 2032, when a lot of the very same ideas we've been talking about are, I imagine them being in practice. It's a novel, so how they can be. If you want to be on a show like this, um, get in touch with uh, John McKenzie or see his email on the screen, and who knows, I'll be talking to you in two weeks' time. Thanks for watching.